Right, unfortunately, one of our usual members of the Friday Club, Kevin O'Ryan, can't be here with us, but one man who used to sit next to him at school is Neil Callan. He joins us now. Neil, a very happy new year to you. Yeah, happy new year, guys. I hope your Christmas and your new year were excellent. Um, let's just start firstly on, on your fine run of form recently. You must be very much enjoying yourself. I think it's five from your last eight uh, rides. You've had winners in uh, Bahrain. Yeah, I think um, last Friday I had three winners and uh, the Friday before I had four. So, yeah, it's going well. Um, riding for a good team, his highness Sheikh Sultan. So, yeah, all's going well. And your plan is to stay out there for, for a fair bit longer, is it? Yeah, so I, I I flew home and spent Christmas uh, with my with my family, which is good, um, and then came back for Friday, obviously. But I'm here, uh, I probably here about a month, and then go back, or sorry, stay here then for January and February. And just in terms of competition in Bahrain, how how do you find the levels differ to over here in the UK and in Ireland as well? Is it do you find it easier to ride winners, or is it very much similar? Um, well, I don't want to be to be rude to the rest of them here, but uh, look, I just ride good horses um, that His Highness Sheikh Sultan buys in the horses in training sales in the UK at Tats, and um, you know, I suppose Martin will, will will tell you that you you cannot win races without the right horses, and and I suppose that's that's what helps me ride so many winners here. But yeah, look, the track is very easy to ride, and uh, been in race once a week, so. Plenty of time to go in fresh. I was going to say, Martin, have you have you ever ridden out in Bahrain? Uh, no, I've never been to Bahrain. It's mm. one place I'm... I have to say, Neil, considering you only ride once a week, you could have had a shave before you came on. Uh, we were meant to ride today, and it was called off because of the rain, so I'm pretty relaxed. So you, you, went to to the, you went to the Middle East to escape the weather, and then it follows you, huh? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. So with all this time on your hands, Neil, have you been following what's happening... Over here with the with the whip rules and a little bit. Um, I have been in a bit of dialogue with uh, Ryan Moore and Dale Gibson from the PGA because, as you know, I'm on the advisory board, so I'm on that group chat. And um, I, I, you'll know as well that I like to voice my opinion. So, <laughs> but I only like to voice my opinion when it's uh, something that's worth uh, voicing about. In terms of the. Uh edict that has been lifted on, on the backhand position being used over the forehand position now that the forehand is back in action. I must imagine that that's a, that's a bit of relief to you in the weighing room. Yeah, look, I, I think overall it is. Um, you know, it's, it's it's quite strange because, you know, from day one, as soon as this, this uh, rule or the proposed rule was coming out, I was very, very anti it. Um, I thought it was going to create more problems than it was good uh, in, in you know, for, for racing in general. Um, and considering that um, British racing needs as much positive vibes as it does negative, more than it does negative. So um, I voiced my opinion quite a lot. Um, I thought it was only going to be bad um, considering it's going to take so long to kind of educate the next generation uh, before it can be become a customary. Uh, I, I just didn't think it was going to, it was going to sit well, but look, um, I'm glad, I suppose, in the end that it's kind of, uh, they've listened to us. Um, I think it was only probably about uh, seven, eight weeks ago, I was in a meeting uh, at the British Racing School with some um, some guys from the BHA and Ryan Moore and, and Dale Gibson and, and, and a few others. And I pressed them really strongly on it as well as the rest of us. And, um, you know, that that was the main, that was the main thing that we needed changing was, was back to the forehand because... With the design of the whip that has been designed under the BHA, um, saying that it's, 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 it doesn't hurt and it's only for encouragement, that um, to say that it's a welfare issue it was completely wrong. Would you say with the restrictions as they are now, with the status quo back in place, we've obviously seen that the this number of strikes we're allowed to use has been reduced by one, but in the current guise, do you think we're in a good place with the whip as it stands? Yeah, I think we were in a good we were in a good place before as it was anyway. And I think if you look over the last 10, 15 years, and now just if you look at it, I have only been back in, in the UK for a whole full season. So 
if you look back to when I rode in 2011, right up to the current day, I think if you look at the stats, not data, like they keep going on about this data. Everything now is data, data, data. It's not. Just look back and see how many uh, transgressions there's been on the higher end is very, very minimal. And um, I think it's been policed very well. Um, I think there was nothing wrong with the rule as it was. But if it means that we have to appease, well, not us, but the BHA have to appease animal welfare people who keep banging on the drum every 10 years, um, well, you know, so be it. Neil, you've, you've ridden all around the world and you've been away for a long time. So w would you say that when you came back, did you look at our racing and say, we need to look at these whip rules because there's a problem? Or do you feel that we have, the, the governing body have just pandered to a very, very small minority? And in fact, our whip rules were probably, the, you know, probably one of the best in the world as they were. 100%. Like, I mean, I rode in Hong Kong for 10 years and they're... they're Obviously, there's a, you, you can't abuse them and you can't hit them out of contention or down the shoulder, but there's no restriction on how many times you can use it in a race if a horse is responding. Um, I think there's the times that if, if they didn't feel like, and, you, and you've ridden there before, that if you weren't using it enough, you were questioned. So, um, you know, if there's not going to be a worldwide universal rule, um, how can you go from jurisdiction to jurisdiction and kind of fall into whichever rule, whatever jurisdiction you go to. And then, like, especially me coming back from Hong Kong, like, I mean, I had to really, really concentrate on um, my use of the whip. And I felt like I did it to a certain extent. And there was times that I was going over, but I was conscious of it. But I was just trying my best, obviously, to win and trying my best to within within the rules. And I felt like I did that. And I felt like when I came back that everybody else and that rule as it stood at the time, before these new rules came in, I didn't see anything wrong with them at all. Yeah, very interesting that, Neil. A new rule that's being implemented in the next few days is one that if you go four strikes or more over the current six strikes that you're allowed, then you will be referred to London and uh, referred to the authorities and you may end up losing the race. So, for example, if you're riding in the Queen Anne and you rode a winner and you went to pick up the trophy, you might go and pick up the trophy and know you're going to lose it. What, what do you make of that? Well, this is obviously just to protect uh, the betting um, purely. Um, so whether the BHA are covering their own backs on that respect, because they've had pressure from the, the betting operations, um, I very highly believe that. Um, considering that... Um, I suppose a lot of the board from, from the BHA have got betting backgrounds. So, you know, what happens behind closed doors with them, with, with, uh, with the betting organisations, is, is not transparent, is it, I suppose? So you so don't think it's been transparent enough? Yeah. On certain aspects, no. And um, I think that's probably been the biggest issue. And this is why there's been so many of us uh, lobbying or... Um, you know, uh, complaining, or not, yeah, I suppose kind of complaining, um, but lobbying against, um, you know, um, certain things. Like, like look at look at the, the, the rule that came out and then they, they changed it. And then obviously the, the media and the press said, oh, the BHA have backtracked. And then you see uh, today that uh, David Jones, the, the non-exec director of the BHA, has come out and said, well, no, it wasn't the BHA. Everybody was on the the chairing, the steering group, blah blah blah, and everyone is aware. But it's always the way. Like everybody, they've they've come out today and deflected, but it's been changed. We voiced our concerns. Now it's done and dusty. But yet they have to come out and have the last say to kind of deflect everything away from them and half put the blame back towards us, saying that oh well, we knew about it and you know we were in the discussions and you know it's it's just you know. Transparency is, is, is a big issue, I think, and always it's has quite, been. It's quite frustrating, Neil, isn't it? Because a lot of people have said, why are jockeys only complaining about it now? When, in fact, as you've just explained, and I know myself, it's crazy because we complained about it and raised concerns about these rule changes the day after they were announced, didn't we? And, and we only learnt of them the day, after, the day they were announced, uh, when we read it in the Racing Post, and we didn't have a say. So 
there's a lot of untruths in that in that way. There's no transparency. We, from the minute you know they they were announced, we we all said these the, these are strange and these these are not not going to work. Certainly with the backhand forehand. But something I hadn't really put a lot of thought into and, until Tom raised it earlier is the disqualification. It's going to be weird, isn't it? Like Tom says, if you if you ride a winner at Royal Ascot for argument's sake and you go one over, you hit the horse one too many times, which can be done, I'm afraid. It, you know, and um, you know, you go in and watch the replay, you know you're going to lose it four days later. Are you going to want to walk out and collect a trophy for a Group 1 race, knowing that you're going to lose it four days later? And what about the guy who's finished second? It's, it's going to create a strange atmosphere within racing for, for everybody, I suppose, except the guy who's had his money on the horse that's won, would you say? Well, no, um, I... I... I'm not sure if that's the case, though, is it? If you go one over, that it's disqualification. I think if you go four over the permitted level, then you're looking likely to be disqualified. Yeah, sorry, I mean, I mean, you, you know, you go, you go, you know, you go over if the you permitted go four level. Over, which is yeah. a complete disregard. Now, look, there is a little bit of um, agreement in that, that like, Clearly, you know if you've gone four over and then you know you're going four over in, during a race. If you go one over, you can think, you know, it's a little bit, you know, you're not going to go through a race, Martin, as you know. We don't count when we're using them. Yes, you can think and you know how many times you use them. We're not stupid. But in the heat of the moment, sometimes in a tight finish, you might just go one over. And it's not true um, deliberate. You know, it's not a deliberate move but you might just go on over. And if you get a suspension, um, you take it. But under the previous rule, it was like sometimes it was discretion. Now, this is where I think transparency is the key because if you go on over six months ago or a month ago, you might get away with it or you might not. Whereas now, if you go on over, you're going to get suspended. Now, that's... That's fair enough because this is the rule. You know as it is, it's black and white. I can agree with that. But I think if you're going to start saying you go over four hits, which is a disregard because you clearly know you have, but if you're going to say four days later you're going to be summoned to the BHA knowing you're going to lose the race, but the result is not changed on the day for betting purposes, that that's a bit... That's a bit strange, but, you know. Neil, very interesting comments, though, I have to say. Just before we let you go, get your reflections on your 2022 season coming back to the UK and obviously culminating with that fine success aboard Fontaine and Group 1 Company. Yeah, it was, um, geez, I couldn't have, I couldn't have uh, wished for a better season coming back. Um, before I came back to England, I was, I was thinking, actually, like, should I ride or should I not ride? And, you know, would I be able to get back to the level that I was at? Because that's clearly where I wanted to be. Um, and I didn't really want to be in a struggling position. So I kind of came back at the end of that season previous and kind of just rode a bit, teamed up with Marco, had a few nice horses, came into my first full season, very open-minded, but kind of teamed up a little bit with Kevin, had a couple of winners from early, had a good association with Marco and then, my agent, Stephen Croft, was doing a great job. He was getting me into stables that I'd never ridden bef before Before I was riding previously in the UK. So I think the momentum built up and it got into Royal Asuka. I won there on um, Rising Star from Agobotti. And then I won the Silver Saddle at the Sugar Cup. And then uh, capped off with Fontaine for Kevin Ryan. And it couldn't have been any more fitting winning for Kevin. I, um, I can see on, you smiling, on, Neil. On a Philly uh, bred by uh, Shape of Aid. And uh, listen, it was, you know, she'd had a few goals at Group 1 level and she hadn't quite got there. But this, you know, to, to win the Sun Chariot, which is actually sponsored by uh, Bahrain uh, Jockey Club, um, yeah, it was pretty special and um, very, very happy. Very happy day. We're just looking back at the race now, actually, Neil. And I know that she was a fairly big price, I think around about 16 to 1 shot. But going into the contest, how confident were you that she might have had a chance of winning? Well, to be fair, Kevin Ryan gave me all the confidence I needed. He said to me that um, 
you know, I'll, I'll, I'll give you rides. I've got lads riding up here, so I've got to look after them. And I was like, yeah, fair enough. Open-minded, relax, go with the flow. And he said, uh, he rang me up five days before this, and he said, I've been waiting all season to get you on the right one. And he said, I've got you on it. You're going to ride this filly in the Sun Chariot, and it's going to be the best chance you'll ever have to ride a Group 1 winner for me since you've left. So I was like, that'll do me. So it was just... Um, just, it, it just, it's like everything. The stars align and everything happens, and the rest is history. And well, hopefully, you say, I can carry that when one when door closes, one opens, Neil. Um, and we've seen you smiling when we mentioned Fontaine. And like you say, Kevin said he'd get you on a group one minute, but that is just typical of you, isn't it? You'd fall out of a window and go up. Poor Andrea <laughs> lost the job the week before. <laughs> you get, you come back from Hong Kong, you've been 60 odd winners that year, and you get on a group one winner straight away. I mean, I mean, there's the elements of luck getting on the horse, but to be fair, you gave, him a, gave her a great ride, but you must have been really happy with uh, you know, coming back with a Group 1 winner. Yeah, of course. And listen, Martin, you know, you ride your luck. Um, uh, it's, it's, sometimes it's up, sometimes it's down. And, you know, unfortunately for you, you've had a very difficult season missing out on a very good horse. And, um, you know, um, whether you come back or not, if you do come back, and, and, and hopefully you do, that uh, your day will come that you land on a Group 1 and it pushes you back into the limelight again. Well, let's hope so. That's what we're all looking for. Um, I've got to ask you before you go, Neil. Uh, you were at school with uh, our Friday club um, regular, Kevin O'Ryan. What was he like? What was, was that the naughty table you were sat on, yourself and him at school? <laughs> it, was, it, was, it was normally the tension. I suppose. <laughs> 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 now, Kevin, Kevin, Kevin's a good guy, really good fella. Um, his family are steeped in racing, um, and it's it's so mad that um, I, I I did my GCSE levels, and then um, I dropped out and went to racing. And then it's so fitting that when I came back, when I came to England, and I came into racing and done so well that Kevin Ryan. Kevin O'Ryan, that I sat next to, would be uh, an amateur jockey for Dermot Weld, go on to presenting. And then another good pal of mine, um, Mark McStay, went on to the flying start with Dali. And now he's a, a highly prominent um, bloodstock agent and he lives in Newmarket. So we're good pals. And uh, it's amazing how it kind of comes around and you meet up with these people who you met when you were younger. So, yeah, it's, it's um, you just got to be happy for a good life, isn't you? So it's, it's fair to say that school has produced some of the, the top top men in racing, Neil. Listen, thanks very much for joining us. Uh, wish you all the best of luck in, uh, in the Middle East. And uh, Happy New Year. All right, guys. Happy New Year. And thanks for having thanks, me Neil. on. Watch live racing now on racingtv.com.